um, I want to welcome you to the seventh uh, annual Women's Health Forum, uh, which uh, the Wisdom Center runs. And uh, Wisdom, as you just heard, uh, was created by the Dean's Office through a strategic planning process um, with a vision statement of healthy women and men from conception through the life course and a mission of advancing human health uh, across the lifespan through research and education in women's health, the biology of sex differences, and gender medicine, which I'll explain to you uh, as we go along. Uh, just to orient you, this is a whole track in Health Matters. We're very excited to be partnering with them today. And um, when I finish, I'll come back to this slide and introduce Jennifer Tremel, the Assistant Professor of Medicine, who's the Clinical Director of the uh, Women's Heart Health uh, at Stanford, and also uh, Judy, uh, Jody Prochaska, Judith Prochaska, who just arrived, and that's really great. Um, and then I want you to know that we're going to move over to the Clark Center for a speed panel on women's cancer, and then we come back here after lunch at 1 o'clock for a final set of talks on um, skin and bones and sleep health. So the topic of why sex and gender matter in precision health for women is really much more than a 15-minute talk, which is all I have time to do today. So I'll try and touch on some of the key issues of sex and gender and how it impacts health of women and some of the unique health features. I'm not going to do sex differences. There's not enough time. I'll just focus on unique issues for women. I want to touch on the important role of caregiving in women, which is a huge burden that uh, obviously many men do as well, but women have the higher burden on that. And then uh, end with a little bit on sex and gender identity. So to start with the sex and gender concept, uh, I want to make the distinction so you understand that we see these as very different entities. So when we talk about sex, the Institute of Medicine back in 2001 released their report having looked at all of the biology, uh, basically saying that sex does matter. They defined it as the biological quality or classification of sexually reproducing organ, organisms, generally male or female, according to reproductive function and organs that derive from the chromosomes. And because chromosomes are in every cell, they basically said every cell has sex. And what you should know is that very few cell biologists ever tell you about the sex of the cell or even know about it, which is not very precise medicine. And so one of the issues is to get them to recognize that precision concept. Gender, on the other hand, is the sociocultural issues. And although the IOM reported this as, or presented this as a person's self-representation or male and female, what's really important from biology is the role of gender norms and gender roles on biology. We, in, it influences biology in very profound ways that I'll give you a couple examples as we go along. And also gender relations. People treat you differently because you're a woman. So just as we talk about race ethnic issues and we talk about socioeconomic issues, being a woman, the whole world treats you differently than if you were a man. And that said, many people want to identify uh, with something other than the way they were designated at birth or as they were designated at birth, and that's your ge gender identity. And I'll just draw your attention to the Gendered Innovation site here at Stanford. Londa Schiebinger has really been driving this important message, and she and I are very uh, closely working on this. Now, if we talk about sex, um, in the old days, you had to be born before they knew what sex you were, and then they would say, oh, it's a boy, it's a girl, based on your genitalia. And now you can find out ahead of time. But then over time, bones start to change because of the chromosomal and the hormones. And we end up with some very di clear differences that overlap a lot. So we have many tall women, and we have many short men. But we generally have a, an overlap. And we also have a lot of differences in our bones. And these are genetically driven as well as hormonally. So I'm putting here the pelvis. This is the most sexually dimorphic bone in your body because the evolutionary pressure to get that head out of that pelvis, if you're a woman, is so high that you're dead if you don't get that out. And so there's very po powerful genetics working on those bones that hardly anyone has really studied. On the other hand, there's a lot of pressure to keep a nice narrow pelvis so that you can run and you can be locomoting. And so those two pressures diverted a lot of the male-female pathways. On top of that, we have lots of other body composition changes. So we generally think of men as being more muscular. Obviously, we have very muscular women. And we think of women as having more fat. Much of this is essential fat, very important for reproductive function and health. 
Uh, and we distribute that fat in different places based on hormones. So there's a lot of biology that is very integrated in the medical outcomes that we talk about. On the other hand, we have gender. And gender is really the social meaning of being female and male. And you can just see some examples. This changes over history. It changes in different cultures. It changes within cultures. And it has very profound effects. So for instance, one reason that men are stronger than women isn't just because they have more muscle, but we make them carry a lot of stuff. And so we had to kind of fight our way, like, let me carry that. And now that I'm older, it's like, it's fine. You know, you can carry it. Uh, so at any rate. Um, and then I want to make an example. So in addition to that example, this is a great example of where gender can actually completely change biology. So for a 1,000 years, Chinese foot binding was in practice. Um, it was a sign of beauty to have the smallest foot possible. You wanted a thir three to four inch foot. And so they started binding little girls' feet when they were five, or seven, five to seven years of age. And the girls, the, the mother-in-law would go and look at the girl to be sure that her foot was small enough and beautiful enough before she would be married. Now, obviously, you can't walk on that foot, so those women had to be carried. And, and one reason we have rickshaws and we have some of the things is that we had to transport women around because they couldn't walk, unless you were poor, in which case you needed your feet to work, and so you didn't get your foot bound. Now, I will tell you that we actually still have a lot of stuff like this going on. Uh, if we look at the US today, we still are you know, making it a little bit harder for women to walk around, and that's part of our culture. Women drive this just uh, probably more than men, so it's not men doing this to women. It's something that's part of culture. Now, to come back to biology, if you're not aware, most of our basic science is based on males. We don't know what the sex of the cell is, but we do know that most animal studies are done in male animals. This was a review that was, uh, came out in 2009 looking at all of those different disciplines. The blue is where it's male driven. The big red one is in reproduction where obviously we would have more female. And the purple is what we would see as the goal, which is to have both sexes so we could look at is there a difference or not. And only 26% of animal studies fell in that category. A little better in humans, 60%. Overlap, still a lot more blue, except for the category of reproduction. And this is a serious issue, because what we've now learned is that women metabolize drugs differently. They metabolize alcohol differently than men. And we have this crisis where a lot of drugs have gone to market without being adequately tested in women. Eight of 10 that have been pulled off the market have been because of very adverse reactions in women that should have been studied before they ever went to market. And a very popular story came out uh, about two years ago on Zolpidin, which is the leading sleep medication for insomnia. Women get a lot more insomnia, so they use this much more often. And what they found is that 15% of women were waking up the next day, eight hours after taking it, still with lots of this in their system, going and driving to work and having accidents, compared to only 3% of men. Now, in fact, that is the only FDA drug that has a male and a female dose. And you see it comes in a pink bottle and a blue bottle. Many men should be taking a lower dose. And now they have to take it from the pink bottle. In this society, that's like putting a stop sign on the bottle. So again, we need precise medicine. And we need to start to think about what's the right drug for men and women. Uh, and just to make the point, this is not just body weight. A lot of things relate to body weight. But women's body composition is different. The way we metabolize our liver is different. All of this needs to be studied. The NIH gets it. Uh, in 2014, they basically said, we need to start balancing. We need to start having in our basic animal work. Now, at that time, they actually said cells as well. When the, when the update came out from the NIH last year, they only focused on animal studies uh, because they found out that the cells they have, the cell lines, they don't even know what sex they are because they've been transformed in such a way that we're not even clear what the sex of the cell is. So it's not exactly a precise cell to be studying. So if you're not aware, as of this year, um, it's absolutely required that you include males and females. We recognize that it, it's important for the interpretation of the data and that if you don't include that, you have to have strong justification in your grant for why you don't have males and females in animal and human studies. Um, and so now just to say a few unique things, if you're not aware, women are mosaics. It's like a calico cat. Calico cats are almost always female. 
And it relates to the fact that early on, and I, I realize now I thought I'd have a pointer, but I'll, I'll draw your attention to the egg. And you see this egg being ovulated there. That egg is going to have two X's, one from the mother's mother and one from the mother's father. And if you can see it, there's a little sperm that's about to reach that egg in the fallopian tube. That sperm, the sperm are either the X, the father's X that came only from his mother or the father's Y that came only from his father. We can actually track whole cell lines based on Y chromosomes. We can look at whole human migration based on Y chromosomes because only males can pass it to males, with many exceptions, and I don't have time for all those exceptions. But the important point I wanted to make here is that once those two unite, the fate is sealed in a very interesting way because as the, that embryo starts to develop, Decisions have to be made. We don't want two X's in most cells. 75% of cells have to be completely inactivating those X's, and then there's a variation in the other 25%. And what you're seeing on that diagram of the mosaic is that a random thing occurs where an X, the father's X is, is inactivated in one tissue, in one cell, and the mother's in the other. But take a look at how early this happens. This is happening in the embryonic development before any organ is made, before we even have all of the layers. So it's very, very early on, and this is one reason why identical twin girls are not as identical as identical twin boys, because it could be a completely different random process. But at any rate, those cells, are, every tissue in your body is a mosaic, so that if we look at the retina, uh, we have some, if there's an X-linked problem on the retina, the red and green cones for vision are on the retina are on the X chromosome, the blue's not, so the blue doesn't have that sexual problem. But basically, boys are more likely going to be colorblind because they only have one X. And what we learn is that the X that isn't reducing a mutation seems to overtake the other ones in females, so they end up with tissues that are less likely to be expressing that bad X. Hemophilia is another very good example. And the last one I want to mention is a rare issue that relates, it looks a little bit more like the calico cat, to let you know that you have sweat glands all over your body that are from these mosaics. And so you have big patches where if you have this particular X, X problem, you can't sweat. And so for a female, she can still regulate her temperature in the good tissue, but for a male with that X, he dies very early because he can't regulate his temperature. So it's rare. We have lots of those that no one has studied because we're studying every gene in the universe and paying very little attention to this. That's not precise health. That's not precise medicine. We need to be more precise. Um, and then I'll just quickly say, if you're not aware, uh, something else that's a big difference between men and women is that the, the egg, the, the germ cells, do all of their divisions up to the last one before you're born. In boys, they stop much before that. So that what we have is a situation that women are born with all the eggs they'll ever have. They don't start ovulating until puberty. Boys don't even have that division until puberty. Then they start that process. And another big difference is that girls, well, I'll come back to the other difference. The point being that girls run out Men, women run out and we have menopause, men can continue being reproductively capable up until they're, they're dead. This is, a, this is a graph of showing you the eggs, and you can just see how every five years you drop, you drop, you drop, so that very first really big drop is age 35. There's not many eggs left. By the 40 and the 45, there's hardly anything left to get pregnant. You're lucky, or you do assisted reproductive technology, a really important issue for older women. Uh, and that the next thing is going to be menopause, which we'll come back to. I first want to just go back again to the embryo and let you all know that every person in this room started out with the potential of being either male or female. And then because of the chromosomal complement and a number of factors, a decision is made in embryology where you're either going to go down the male path and you're going to retain the, the tubes that you need to be a male, you're going to have a testes, or you go down the female path and the, the indifferent gonad will become an ovary and you're going to have the tubes that you need to be a female. The female organs stay up in the pelvic cavity, the male organs come out of the cavity, sperm can't live very well in, uh, the, body in the body temperature and so we need to get that out. 
and also because of the testes uh, and the testosterone, we're going to change the external genitalia, which could be male or female at the outset. So we all have the ability to be either of these sexes, and decisions are made that we live with. Now, I will tell you other transitions. This was actually a transition slide of puberty, but it had um, breast developing and, and pubic hair developing, which we thought wasn't quite right for this audience, perhaps. But I will say that an important thing is that then part of puberty is the menstrual cycle. Women for, from age 13, 11, 11 to 51, so that's 40 years, have menstrual cycles where their biology is changing through the month. This was one reason no one wanted to study females, like they're too complicated. It's like, yeah, but we are, and we should study it. That's precision. And so we change all, every through the month. But we might not. We might get pregnant. And what you'll hear from uh, Dr. Tremel after I finish is pregnancy is a big cardiovascular stress test. That is like a very profound physiological change that women go through. Some women actually develop hypertension during pregnancy that predisposes them to hypertension later. Not really sure which comes first, the predisposition and then the stress test, and also gestational diabetes. Pregnancy alone causes lots of differences between men and women. We actually know that cells from the embryo reside in women after, like 30 years after they've delivered that baby that probably relate to some of the autoimmune diseases. So we have lots of issues that are really precise. Um, the other thing, just to kind of go through the lifespan here, uh, what you're seeing is really kind of focusing on bones. Before I do that, I want to come back to those eggs. The, a very big difference between men and women is that the egg, the, the ovum, is the source of the estrogen. In the case of males, the sperm are unrelated to the they're, they're influencing each other, but the testosterone-making cells are different from the sperm. And so you can continue making testosterone, you continue having sperm. For females, it's all together, and basically you hit a point where there's not enough eggs anymore, so there's not enough estrogen anymore. And in addition to things that are happening with estrogen dropping and related to bones, women suffer for about three years with uh, hot flushes, which is a very serious issue. No one was even studying that until the Women's Health Initiative came out because it's like, well, women don't die from menopause, so why would we worry about it? It's a huge quality of life issue. Um, I will just quickly say that when we talk about the causes of death in men and women, they're very similar, with obviously breast cancer being an exception. Only 1% of breast cancers are men. But I will point out that it's not the leading cause of cancer death. Lung cancer is. We are going to have a set of talks on the cancers in women. Note that breast cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death, but even though it's the most common cancer. But then there are some other very unique cancers that we will talk about. There's actually sex differences in almost all of those cancers that are really interesting that we don't have time to talk about. Uh, I don't have time to also talk about the caregiving issues, but uh, we actually think about the women as the chief medical officer of most families. They really are the ones that have to know about drugs. They have to take care of children. They have to take care of spouses. They have to take care of parents. They have a huge burden of caregiving. Uh, and so the, I'm going to end by just talking about sexual um, health. I don't have time to talk about this except to say that the World Health Organization recognizes sexual health not as a dysfunction and the focus of absence of dysfunction, but actual health. And to just kind of finish this, um, we know that sexual values vary a lot by socioeconomic status, practices, policies. Um, in our culture, I would call our culture a sex negative culture, where we think about good girls and bad girls and sluts and virgins from the past, um, and that basically women aren't really given the freedom to completely enjoy this. And furthermore, because we're so dichotomous, good, bad, men, women, we also don't accept the range of possibilities for people's gender and sexual identity. All of these are things that the Wisdom Center feels is very important and that we will continue. Now, I'm going to actually 
not engage questions. You'll have me all day long and you can ask me questions. So what I want to do now is take my time to uh, introduce our next speaker. So Jennifer Tremel is the clinical director of the Women's Heart Health at Stanford. She's going to be talking to you about women and heart disease, your risk and what you can do about it. And when she finishes, she will go right to Judy, Jody Prochaska, Judith, but I call her Jody Prochaska, uh, who will be talking about heartbeats and tweets, social media support groups for promoting heart health. I then just want to remind you that we'll all be going to the Clark Center for the Women's uh, Cancer Panel and then returning here later for the uh, skin and bones and uh, sleep health. But I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Tremel now, who I've known for a very long time. And she has really revolutionized women's heart health at Stanford. We would not have a clinic. Uh, so this is a very wonderful part of Stanford. And uh, Jennifer is a wonderful person. Yeah, thank you. And that was a great talk. Thank you. Good morning. I'm really glad to have the opportunity to be here. Um, we have a short bit of time, so I'm going to hopefully give you some good highlights today, a little bit about heart disease in women, uh, as well as maybe some tips to take care of yourself. Um, so I'm an interventional cardiologist, so I open up heart, heart, heart arteries um, and also take care of women in clinic. Um, we started a program in 2007. Our mission is really um, through prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of cardiovascular disease and its impact on psychiatric psychosocial well-being to provide comprehensive cardiovascular care to women across their lifespan, utilizing an evidence-based, personalized, multidisciplinary approach. Um, and really what we hope to do ultimately is to eliminate sex and gender disparities in cardiovascular medicine. So the team um, at Stanford started out with myself and a nurse practitioner, and uh, now there are 15, 16 of us. Um, we have several cardiologists, preventive cardiologists, psychologists, dietitian. Um, I even have a postdoctoral fellow who's a man, um, so we're very proud of him, um, and he's doing great work with us as well. So um, I'm always the party pooper when I get up here, so I uh, give you the cold, hard facts about cardiovascular disease and everyone gets depressed. Um, so I'm going to do that now. So get ready. Um, so as you know, cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death among women in the United States. It's also a leading cause of death among men. It's the second leading cause of death for women aged 45 to 64, and the third leading cause of death for women 25 to 44. And I think we often think of it as, oh, it's an old person's disease, um, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, so the women we see in clinic, uh, our mean age is actually in the 50s. Heart, the cardiovascular disease kills one out of uh, every three women. So this is where I say look to your left, look to your right, one of you. Um, that will be what your cause of death. Um, it kills five times as many women as breast cancer um, and almost twice as many women as all forms of cancer combined. Um, so it's a big deal. Um, and you can see a lot of pink stuff and you know, all of that, and certainly breast cancer is important. Um, but uh, we really do need to focus on cardiovascular disease and wear our red, red dresses um, so that we raise awareness. And when we look compared to men, um, we know that more women have died from cardiovascular disease uh, every year since 1984. Um, and compared with we men, women have higher lifetime uh, risk of stroke. And also women are more likely to die after their first heart attack than men. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. Women aren't always uh, aware that they're having a heart attack. Um, they often take too long to get into to, uh, the emergency room. And then physicians still are not um, terribly kind of aware um, of women, their symptoms, what to do with them, et cetera. So that's something we're working on. Um, this statistic's really bothersome to me. So even when women say, yeah, I know it's the leading cause of death, um, they don't internalize this information. So only 20% of women actually think that heart disease is their greatest health threat. Um, I think they think it's somebody else. This won't be my problem. That's not true. <laughs> so I've given you the statistics. Um, it is your problem. So, and you can't profile heart disease. Um, you know, I think people also say, well, you know, I don't look like somebody who's going to have heart disease, you know, and, um, and I think you can pick out who's going to have heart disease. Um, and I know we have people in this room who have heart disease. Um, these are the faces of heart disease. Um, these women are survivors in our uh, clinic. Um, they were at our Go Red luncheon with the American Heart Association recently, um, and they had the strength to tell their story um, so that other women could know. Um, but these are the faces of heart disease, right? So these aren't necessarily what you might think. 
So the good news is that most of cardiovascular disease is preventable. Uh, so you can't help who uh, your parents were, um, and you can't help getting older, although I'm trying to work on that one. Um, but there are uh, several things that are modifiable, and so everyone should know um, their risks. It turns out 90% of women have one or more risk factor for heart disease or stroke. So pretty much everybody in this room has something that they need to work on um, to improve their cardiovascular health. So these are the things that you should know um, as, as preventable risks. So your cholesterol level, so you need to know what your cholesterol level is. Having a high LDL or bad cholesterol is not a good thing. Um, or having a low HDL or good cholesterol. In addition, um, diabetes, you don't want to have diabetes. Basically, people have diabetes. We say you basically have heart disease already. It's an equivalent. So knowing your blood sugar um, and making sure that it's preferably under 100. If it's between 100 and 125, um, you're basically pre-diabetic. And above 125, you have diabetes. Knowing your blood pressure as well. High blood pressure is associated with cardiovascular disease. Don't smoke. Uh, most people in this area know this. Um, but actually, the highest rates of increased smoking are currently in young women, unfortunately. Having a sedentary lifestyle, and that means that you're getting less than 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity on most, if not all, days of the week. Um, so thinking about if that applies to you. Um, and then having excess weight uh, and where your body mass index is what we usually look at. So if you have a body mass index of 25 to 30, you're overweight. And if it's greater than 30, um, you're obese. There are other risk factors. Um, these are kind of the classic ones. Um, you're going to hear some about stress, and we think stress um, you know, plays a big role. Uh, also, pregnancy is a little marker for us, uh, and I think we don't do a good job of kind of capturing women at that time and letting them know that your risk may be elevated based on what happened to you during pregnancy. So women who develop gestational diabetes, get high blood pressure, uh, preeclampsia, have a preterm delivery, or gain excess weight that they ultimately never lose have an almost double um, risk of developing cardiovascular disease in the next 10 years. Um, so it's actually pretty quick um, that this plays, uh, plays a role in terms of your risk. Um, so one of the things we do in clinic now is try to capture these women right after their pregnancy, even though they're busy with other things, um, and let them know what their risk is and hopefully uh, do something about it. I think um, the, this American Heart Association score is a nice thing you can do. So you could go online if you want, and it basically will take you through all of those risk factors that I talked to you about, and you can calculate your own score and see where you are. So what about the symptoms? Um, so this is one area where women seem to be a little bit underinformed, um, and that could certainly be to your disadvantage if you don't recognize that you're having a heart problem. Um, and so we want women to be well informed. And women um, do have symptoms that are different than men. The classic is still chest pain, and that's the most common thing that we'll see in um, women and men. This is not necessarily a pain. Um, it's some sort of discomfort. It can be a burning pain. It can be sharp. It can be pressure, heaviness, some sort of discomfort, generally vague in the chest area. Um, and it often radiates other places. Women, it's very common. It goes up in the jaw, may go into the left shoulder, left arm. It could go in the right arm, can go in the back. Um, so it can do a lot of different things. So it's not always classic. Uh, women also will have shortness of breath. Uh, when they're having a heart problem, you may get sweaty, have lightheadedness, uh, feel nausea, um, these sorts of things. So these are all signs that you could be having a problem and things that you need to pay attention to. Um, and it's interesting, you know, I, get, I tell people this, and I actually had a woman after the last time we gave a talk who came up and said, I was so glad you did, told that because, you know, a week later I had those symptoms and ended up in the emergency room. So certainly make note of these. One way that women are different than men is that they um, have more symptoms often, and it gets confusing for doctors. Doctors are much better if you just come in and say, I'm having chest pain. Um, so if you are, just come in and say, I'm having chest pain and they'll pay attention to you. Um, and then when you have these symptoms, you need to get help, right? So you need to call 911 um, and have someone help you. You can take an aspirin as well. Um, this isn't the time to be like, oh, maybe not now. You know, oh, I need to have what I get my clothes out of the dryer before I do this, or you know, I've got to get the kids off to lunch or whatever. Um, if you have the opportunity, another nice thing to look at online, if you YouTube it, is called Just a Little Heart Attack, um, and it features the actress Elizabeth Banks. Um, it's from the American Heart Association. It's 
basically a woman having all these symptoms while she's running around um, and trying to get her kids ready. And she calls 911, and they say, oh, yeah, we'll be there soon. Um, and she looks around and sees the mess, and she's like, could you wait 10 minutes, you know, because she wants to get the house ready. So that's not what you want to do. Um, just briefly, having a stroke is different. So you develop weakness or numbness on one side of your body or your face if you're having a stroke. Difficulty speaking, double vision, or confusion. So a stroke's basically a heart attack of the brain um, rather than of the heart. So I wanted to close with three steps um, that you guys can hopefully take today. And um, these are kind of, uh, I would say, not traditional uh, in terms of what doctors talk about. So all those things I talked about are important, getting your blood pressure down, cholesterol, et cetera. Um, but I think there are other things, and certainly taking care of women in clinic all the time, these issues come up. So the first thing is I would advise that you work less. Um, and that's not such a bad thing, is it? Um, I can't tell you how many women come into clinic and they are working their butts off um, all the time. And, you know, I'm all for lean in and I'm, you know, all for women being strong and, and doing great things. But I can tell you that a lot of women are literally killing themselves um, from working this hard. Um, you know, they're trying to have it all and that may not be possible. And ultimately, if we sit down and talk about what do you want at the end of your life, um, I don't think it, many of them want to say, I want to look back and say, gosh, I worked really really, really hard. Um, and they're not enjoying other things, and they're not taking time for other things. Um, and so I would encourage people to look at your schedule and find out, is there anywhere I can cut back? I have a patient who, she works with the stock market. And so the stock market's open at 6 a.m. out here, right? And so she was going home at 5 p.m. And I was wondering, why are you working at, starting at 6 and going home at 5? All of her staff goes home at 3. Nobody's there anymore. The East Coast is closed. What are you doing? Um, and really, sh there, she didn't have a good answer for that. Um, but she did tell me she didn't have enough time to exercise, and she didn't have enough time to be with her family and that sort of thing. So we worked on cutting back. Can you go home at 4? Or can you go home at 3? So things like that. And the second thing I would recommend is sleep more. Um, also a good thing. So sleep has become, um, or has been, I think, a bad word in a, in a lot of respects. Um, you're tough if you don't sleep much. Um, and I certainly grew up in that environment, right? As physicians, the less we slept, I didn't sleep 40 hours. I didn't sleep 41 hours, you know? Um, but in fact, sleep's a wonderful thing. Um, and I think people are not getting enough sleep. I think they're struggling with sleep. When we looked at our clinic, insomnia was all over the place. Um, and so our psychologists work with people to help them sleep better, um, learn how to relax relax when it's time for bed, put your iPhone away and things that are keeping you awake um, so that you can get more sleep. People who get more sleep take better care of themselves. They have the energy to exercise. They have um, the energy to make the right choices. And speaking of which, the last thing I would recommend is that you make more good choices than bad. Um, and this is just a simple bit of advice for everyday life. Everything that we do is a choice, all right? So if I pick up the cookie or I don't pick up the cookie, if I go for my walk, I don't go for my walk. All choices, right? And so every time before we do these things, we can say, hmm, do I want to make a good choice here or a bad choice? Sometimes you're going to make a bad choice. And that's OK. That's part of life, right? If I got up and said, don't ever make a bad choice again, you'd be, that would be ridiculous. But if you can make more good choices than bad ones over your lifetime, um, you're going to ultimately have uh, better heart health and I think overall better health. So I will close with that. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. That was terrific. I'm very pleased to be here with you all today and be among Marsha and Jennifer. And now I'm going to take you into some work that we're doing at Stanford in the research lab. And we've been using social media to better understand how to help people make heart healthy changes, uh, looking a lot at tobacco and starting to look at, into physical activity as well. So with the title, Heartbeats and Tweets, Social Media Support Groups for Promoting Heart Health. Uh, so starting out, I do want to have a disclaimer. This type of intervention is not going to be you know, globally effective for everybody. And so this is just a joke that it's got great reach in terms of potential for social media, but it's not going to be the perfect fit for every issue that you're dealing with. So I'm, glad you, I'm so glad you agreed to meet in person. There are some things that just can't be said in 140 characters. Uh, so Twitter is the platform that we've been using. Uh, it's, it's the technology that we're after. I'm not a huge uh, t uh, Twitter user, but we have been using it effectively in our, in our science. Uh, useful both in terms of bringing people together who may be across the US, potentially across the globe, uh, struggling with a health issue, a health behavior, and supporting each other in, in making those changes. And then as a scientist, it's 
fantastic because we're collecting all these data and we can see how people are dialoguing and connecting with each other and making these choices, making these good and bad choices and, and reporting back to each other. So why social networks? Uh, one of the first studies to look at how social networks impact health was done in the Bay Area. So it's done in Alameda County. Uh, it was 3,000 men, over 3,000 women with repeat surveys over time. And what they found is that social networks related to health. So how connected people were involved in their church, uh, if, their marriage, that was, if they were married, that was health positive. Um, so these were some initial ind indication of that social connections can in and them of themselves impact your longevity. So how do social networks affect health? In a number of ways, through that person-to-person -person contact, you can actually get some negative effects. So you could get the flu from somebody, or you could get secondhand smoke exposure from somebody. So that could be kind of a negative or a positive. Somebody could invite you to go for a walk. Somebody could offer you something healthy to eat. Uh, through access to resources, money, job, information, sharing. Through provision of social support, so being there when somebody's dealing with stress and just listening can be a huge uh, way that social support can affect health. Through social influence, if you're seeing everyone around you uh, drinking more water or getting up in the middle of the day or working at a stand-up desk, those kinds of positive health changes can impact you. And then through social engagement, again, having the cognitive uh, and, and, and interpersonal and kind of joys that you get from connecting with others and also can be stressful, so those, the positive and the, and the negative. Uh, how are our social networks changing? This is some work done by Christakis and Fowler, and they looked at how people know each other and how they're connected. This was on a college campus. And when they initially asked, who are your close friends, and I don't have a laser pointer, but that's the one in the top left there, you see that there are some connections, but it's not a completely filled in map. And then when they asked, okay, who are your close friends and fellow club members? So they're in different clubs on school, on campus together, so they know each other. That started to get a little more dense. And then who are your close friends, club members, and roommates? And that's the bottom left. And you see it's getting further dense. And then they say, okay, who are you Facebook friends with? And oh my gosh, it all fills in. <laughs> all right, so we are incredibly more connected and networked, potentially. Um, but actually what they found is that that density, it kind of clouds what's going on because not everybody in your Facebook page is going to impact you. Um, and so when we're using these social um, network platforms, like with Twitter, we're going to actually trying to get closer to the close friends piece so that we're forming these private groups so that people can connect with each other and not have all the extraneous social media connections that might be going on, so that it stays focused on the behavior of interest. Uh, this shows you how social media has changed over time. Um, there are more and more applications being built in. Facebook has obviously been a leader in the space, but Twitter is also there. Uh, Snapchat, LinkedIn, WordPress, so a number of different uh, social media types. I'm going to focus now on tobacco because it is so relevant to heart health and it's also a really fantastic risk behavior to teach us how do people change, how do people struggle with something that's an addiction that's out there in society and that they're exposed to, that's very social, uh, and so that's what we've been focusing on and because it's the number one cause of preventable death in the U.S. Uh, so while we, you may not see many smokers in, around here, um, it's still nationally it's about 17% of adults smoke and the goal is to get that down to 12%. And so if we're going to reach that goal, and that's the 2050 uh, healthy people goal, we're going to need innovations. And so our group has been looking at social media as that innova innovation so that we can reach out and reach people in their daily lives, not just waiting in my, my, in my office hoping that somebody will knock on the door and say, okay, doc, I'm ready to quit smoking, but actually going out and reaching people out there. So over 80% of U.S. teens use social media, 65% of U.S. adults use social media. I'm going to show this slide just to help you understand that it's not just the efficacy of a treatment uh, that impacts on a public health level. So it's not just that I invent a drug and it helps you know, a big number of people quit smoking and therefore the job is done. Well, no, because if the drug has side effects, if the drug's expensive, if the drug has to be prescribed by a doctor, there can be a lot of barriers to getting that reach out into the population. So even if the social media intervention, even if it doesn't have a blockbuster efficacy as, as big as some of the medications, if it's less expensive, if it's easier to access, then its reach can be bigger, and so then you can have a really broad global impact. There have been some survey studies to see what's the interest level among smokers for getting help with quitting smoking online, and that was found to be high. 
uh, about half of those surveyed in a study in England. And what predicted whether they were interested in using the web to quit smoking was if they wanted to quit, if they had urges to smoke, so they were feeling compelled to use, if they were younger, and if they were frequent users of the internet. So that's kind of the audience that it might be a better fit for. Why Twitter, or what is Twitter? So with Twitter, you are constrained in terms of how many characters your message can be, but you can send multiple messages, so it's not that you can't say more than one thing. Uh, huge use, over 320 million monthly active users, uh, and it's about a quarter of online users use Twitter. It's the highest use, use among adults under 50, among urban residents, and in the upper income brackets. And 80% of Twitter users use it on their mobile device, so on a phone or iPad or something. And though it's widely used, it's received very little uh, study in terms of being a platform for helping people change health behaviors. So why we might use it? You can have persuasive messaging getting out there. You can retweet messages, and so that can further a message so that it gets out more broadly. You can have social influence of opinion leaders. You can have it tailored and directly delivered to individual users so you can personalize it. Uh, and as I said, the content can be passed around. It's accessible. It's free. Um, you can look and get a sense of what the mems are or the themes that's going on in a, in a, in a, in a group, in a community. Uh, and it's accessible, distributed at any time, day or night. Our initial studies that we did, we looked to see what's going on in terms of what's being discussed around tobacco in Twitter already. And we saw this kind of explosion of activity when Miley Cyrus, who's a, a Disney star, was caught smoking. And her fan base just went, you know, exploded. This is in a matter of three days, over 4,000 tweets. Uh, we can't know for cer certain, but we think among young people uh, talking about tobacco. And we looked at the content, the, the sentiment that was being communicated, and a lot of it was, you know, we love you no matter what, Miley, or please quit smoking, Miley, that kind of thing. And it gave us some insights in terms of what kinds of messages get retweeted, what's, the kind of, what's engaging in that community. So as public health uh, people, who might be a little more nerdy, okay, than, so, than the users of, of Twitter and following Miley, how we might engage with that audience to keep the young women from starting to smoke. Uh, then we also looked to see what's, how's Twitter being used in terms of people developing quit smoking groups. Is this already being done? And we did see some activity out there. Uh, so we studied that and we saw over 150 uh, quit smoking groups on Twitter. Um, they had a fair number of smokers, uh, of followers rather, about 100 followers. Um, and we found that um, almost, almost half of the accounts were inactive. They hadn't had any tweeting in the last month. Um, so a fair amount of interest out there, some activity, but then it dying down. Uh, we also saw a lot of commercialization. So on these sites, people were hawking laser treatments and, and um, herbs and supplements and that kind of thing, uh, uh, meditation tapes and such, um, and also e-cigarettes. And this was done fairly, you know, four or five years ago before e-cigarettes were as hot as they are. So I would say now probably every site talks about e-cigarettes. Only eight talked about uh, quit smoking, like a quit smoking group. And we, when we looked at the content, it wasn't consistent with what we would recommend in terms of best practices. So lots of interest on Twitter, but maybe not using it to the optimal way that it could. So popular, virtual free, interactive, available 24-7, and then we can observe what's going on. But there also may be some limitations. The engagement and interactivity may be low. It may die out over time. It may not be consistent with clinical practice guidelines. And then privacy can be a concern. So we were, got funded by the National Institute of Drug Abuse um, to do an intervention to look to develop this uh, platform and see if it could work, see if, if we could have high quality, high engagement, and longevity. This is my colleague, Dr. Connie Peshman, who's at UC Irvine in the School of Business. Uh, and, that, and we did a, a randomized controlled trial to see could we help people quit smoking, would their engagement relate to their quitting smoking, and then what predicted engagement. And this was published recently in Tobacco Control. Uh, I won't go into all the eligibility criteria, but key was that they had to be daily smokers who wanted to quit, and we required that they be daily Facebook users so that they were familiar with that checking in with a social media group, with a virtual group. Uh, I won't go and show you all this, but we screened people to make sure they were eligible, we randomized them, we followed them over 60 days, and we had over 70% that we followed up with, which is good. They were middle-aged, mostly female, uh, varied in terms of their education, in terms of marital status, in terms of their employment, uh, and largely Caucasian, which, we were, which was unfortunate. So we've gotten funding to, to continue in, in a more diverse group. They smoked about a pack per day for about 17 years on average, and they were moderately dependent in terms of their addiction to nicotine. 
We randomized them to two groups. Everybody was referred to quitsmoking.gov, which is the National Cancer Institute site for helping people quit smoking. Everybody received nicotine patches from the study. And then half were randomized either to a private peer-to-peer -peer support group on Twitter or not. So we isolated that effect. There were 20 people in the groups for the peer-to-peer the -peer groups. They were encouraged to tweet each other daily for a period of 100 days. And we would seed the groups with a topic every day. Why are you trying to quit now? How are you managing your withdrawal? Who's supporting you in this process? So that, and we, we matched those seeds so that they were evidence-based. And then everybody every day got a message saying, your group really appreciated hearing from you yesterday, or oh, your group missed you, please, please tweet today, so that we'd have that interaction. Uh, this shows the tweeting over time, starting out with highest activity right when the group is starting, and then it does die out over time. And we heard from some of the members, I don't want to tweet anymore about tobacco. I'm quit. I don't want to be triggered to use. So we do see this as a time-limited treatment and not forever treatment. Um, this shows among the groups it changes over time. Um, and then on average, the groups had over 1,000 tweets. Um, most of the people did participate, and they averaged about 59 tweets um, over that time. Uh, this shows where we had the peaks. And we had the peaks in the morning at the, um, with the 12% where we seeded for the topic of the day. And then another where we told them we hadn't heard from them, and then another where we seeded for the topic of the day in the afternoon. So about a quarter of the tweets um, were from what we were putting in there, but three quarters of it was this spontaneous interaction that they were having with each other, which is great. And this shows some of the variability among the groups, but very pretty consistent. I'll share an example of what we were seeing. This one says, I've smoked, but I hide when I, when I do because I'm ashamed. The other individual said, who are you hiding from? You're, you are the one that wants to quit. Start over and try again. Another person shared, it's OK to trip. You just need to get back on track. It sounds like you want to quit. Maybe you need more patches. The same person who started said, I'm going to get more and start fresh. Thank you. It's OK to stumble. Just keep getting back up. You can do it. And that same person initially, when I saw myself fall, failing, I stopped tweeting so much. Didn't want to bring the rest of you down. Uh, and then shared, you need to keep tweeting. Maybe we can bring you back up. And then another, no, we are here, all here to help any time, day or night, um, you want to smoke, we're here to help you. Um, so it really gets at what we are getting or hoping to develop in terms of having that accountability, that support, uh, encouragement that's evidence-based around the, the, the patch use and so forth. And then on a, on a highlight, only three more days to my 60-day smoke-free. Never would have thought that would happen. 60-day smoke-free for me today. Congrats to you. Mine was yesterday. Thanks. Feels good to be smoke-free. I know that feeling too. So celebrating their successes. Uh, this just shows that we, we looked at who was communicating with who. We found that those who quit smoking and those who relapsed still connected with each other. It's not that the quitters were running off and celebrating, but they were trying to bring up those who had relapsed as well. Uh, we looked at over the time course, where was the activity? And it did peak in the middle, and then in terms of their density and in relationships with each other, and then it did start to fade out over time. Uh, in terms of the quit rates, we saw two-fold greater quit rates if they were in our tweet-to-quit group. 40% reported being quit compared to 20% in the comparison group. Uh, that was among people we were able to interview. Among those, if we counted those who we didn't reach as back to smoking, the quit rates were 33% versus 18%, and that was significant. We found that men did better at quitting smoking in both groups, and this has been seen in the literature, and so we're very curious about that. Um, and we saw that if they participated, that was related. The more tweeting they did, the more likely they were to quit smoking. These are the gender differences. So in both groups, men did better than women. Uh, so we were curious, well, what, we have all these dialogues that's going on in the groups. What is it that women are talking about that might be different from men? And actually, the words they were using were pretty similar. Uh, and that shows the frequency in terms of, of how often they're using the words. Although men talked a little bit more about craving, uh, women um, I'll show, were a little bit more talking about emotional or, or supportive stuff like LOL. When we looked at the social, the semantic networks, how are the words related to each other, not just frequency counts, there we saw some differences. And we saw that men um, were more likely to talk about uh, saving money, so a financial aspect. And for men, the patches, the nicotine replacement was very central to their communications. Whereas for the women, the patches were more on the periphery, so not so much of a focus. And for women, they talked about cold turkey, which the men really were not talking about. And then they were much more social, emotional, social connecting, talking about husbands and birthdays and excitement and that kind of thing. Uh, so we think that process may be different by gender. Um, with that, 
I'm going to keep going. Um, so we found it helped people quit smoking. We did find a gender difference. With this, we got funding with an R01 from the National Cancer Institute now to do a trial where we look at women-only groups compared to co-ed, compared to our cons um, comparison condition. And we're going to continue the groups out further and more time to see uh, in terms of sustaining the quitting. Um, this is the new study. Uh, it's Tweet to Quit 2.0. That's the design I just mentioned. We also have funding from the Stanford Cancer Institute to develop a program for Latino smokers and doing bilingual uh, groups online. And then also working with Jennifer, we've got a project underway, uh, Tweet for Wellness. And this is Mary Opezo, a postdoc, where we're using the same platform but for promoting walking. And if you're interested, you can certainly uh, reach out to us. And there's some contact information. Thank you. Okay.